So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where, where you are in the world and welcome to this um, webinar, Adherence to Guidelines for COPD in Low and Middle Income Countries. That's organized by the American Thoracic Society International Health Committee. My name is um, Obiano Juozo and I work at the University of Lagos and the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. I would first of all like to thank the American Thoracic Society for giving us this opportunity to have this conference and this um, webinar. I also want to thank our distinguished panelists for providing their insights into this very important um, topic of COPD guidelines in low middle income countries. Before we begin, I would like to remind us of um, a few things. First, everyone is muted because um, we have quite a number of participants. So if you have questions, please drop it in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, also remember that this webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to all um, registrants after, the, after this live session. Also, it will be archived in the ATSM website and it will be available on the YouTube channel. So a little bit about today's webinar. It's, um, the aim is to provide an overview of the availability of COPD guidelines in low and middle income countries, as well as the adherence to these guidelines. We all know that the burden of COPD is high in low and middle income countries, where about 80% of all global mortality happens. In addition to that, there's also poor access to guidelines, poor access to treatment. And we know that guidelines, guideline-based care for COPD actually improves outcome. In this webinar, we will examine the availability and access to COPD guidelines in low and middle income countries, and also explore the factors that influence adherence to guidelines in these regions. We we'll provide perspectives from different parts of the world. We we'll have perspectives from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Asia, as well as from Latin America. Um, for this guideline, we have four distinguished speakers. And um, the first person that will speak is Professor Job von Boven. Um, Job is a real world health economist, yes, and a drug outcomes expert. He specialized in lung diseases, including asthma and COPD. He has led the fresh air study in different low and middle income countries, and they've published over peer, um, 150 peer reviewed articles in regarding asthma and COPD in low and middle income countries. The second panelist is um, Dr. William Checkley. Dr. Checkley is an associate professor of Medicine, Interna International Health and Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University. He's also the principal investigator of two large household air pollution studies, the HAPIN trial, and, um, and, Professor, and Dr. Checkley is a recipient of the World Lung Health Award of the ATS. The third panelist is Dr. Babatunde Awokola. Dr. Babatunde is a Nigerian graduate in medicine and he's a family physician with special interest in lung health. He currently practices out of the, the Medical Research Council unit at the, at the Gambia of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Tunde's research interests are in chronic airway diseases and recently he just completed an, a one-year monitoring of ambient air air pollution across 15 um, African cities in eight sub-Saharan African countries. The fourth panelist is Alejandro Casas. And Dr. Casas is an internal medicine and pulmonology specialist from Colombia um, at the University of Barcelona Hospital Clinic in Spain as well. He's also affiliated with that. He received the Excellence in Pulmonology Award of the Latin America, and he was the president of the Latin American Thoracic Society from 2014 to 2016. We want to thank all our speak speakers and them um, for their time, and we want to go into the presentations. 
Hello, my name is William Checkley, and I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care at Johns Hopkins University, and a member of the International Health Committee of the American Thoracic Society. Today, along with my co-chair, Professor Uju Oso, and our invited speakers, we will discuss challenges in the adherence to guidelines for COPD in low and middle income countries. I would like to kick off the webinar by sharing some thoughts on the current state of COPD management, particularly that of gold guidelines and challenges to its implementation in low and middle income countries. I will start by summarizing the global burden of COPD and risk factors for COPD in low and middle income countries, then provide a brief overview of the current state of COPD management, including the gold 2019 strategy followed by a summary of challenges in the implementation of gold guidelines in low and middle income countries. So why care about COPD? In 2019, it was estimated that 212 million people have COPD worldwide with a prevalence of 13%. However, there is significant variability in the prevalence across countries, with some settings having a prevalence as high as 20%. It is also estimated that 3 million people die each year from COPD, with most deaths occurring in low and middle income countries. Moreover, deaths from COPD are expected to increase by more than 30% in the next decade. The most important risk factors for COPD in high income countries is tobacco smoking. In low and middle income countries, in contrast, there are multiple risk factors in addition to tobacco smoking that contribute to explain the trajectory towards developing COPD. And these risk factors start in utero and include micronutrient deficiencies, environmental exposures to household air pollution, to traffic related air pollution in urban settings across the lifespan, to a high burden of respiratory infections starting early in life, to a high burden of tuberculosis and to chronic lifelong exposures to household air pollution, high levels of ambient air pollution, and high concentrations of smoke and dust at work. It is important to remember that COPD is both a preventable and treatable disease, but not curable. So once developed, the goals of COPD treatment include symptoms reduction, maximization and preservation of lung function, prevention of exacerbations, and reduction of mortality. So this can be achieved with evidence-based interventions shown in this pyramid. However, it is also important to recognize that the top three high-value interventions are non-pharmacological and include treatments like vaccinations, in particular influenza vaccination, smoking cessation programs, and physical rehabilitation programs. These should all be considered best buy interventions for COPD in low and middle income countries. However, they are implemented variably, and in many cases poorly, in many low and middle income countries. This next figure summarizes the chronology of COPD medications, starting with the discovery of salbutamol in the late 1960s to the discovery of long-acting medications in the 90s and 2000s, and testing of triple therapy and the discovery of PDE4 inhibitors in the 2010s. However, there has not been a new class of drugs approved in the, in the last decade, and LAVAs, LAMAs, and even in health corticosteroids remain inaccessible in many settings in low and middle income countries. The Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease, or GOLD, guidelines have become an important reference to set national algorithms for COPD treatment in many countries around the world. Important revisions over the decades include changing pharmacotherapy based on FEV1 to one that is based on symptoms, exacerbations, and laboratories like blood eosinophil counts. Here it is important to pause, 
and recognize the potential limitation of the availability of laboratory equipment for Sinovel counts in many resource poor settings in low and middle income countries. The most recent change to gold guidelines includes separation of initiation from escalation algorithms. Initial pharmacotherapy is now based on the ABCD symptom and exacerbation classification to consider the appropriate starting control or therapy, which are noted to the right of the two by two classification table. One can use short acting bronchodilators for those who are at low risk of exacerbations and have fewer symptoms to double or triple therapy for those who are at high risk or have more symptoms. So one advantage of the new ABCD classification is that the use of simple questionnaires like the COPD assessment test and the modified MRC dyspnea scale shown here can help facilitate classification of COPD grade and guide initial pharmacotherapy. This is potentially very appealing in low and middle income countries. However, it is also important to note that spirometry as shown here, remains as a tool for classification of COPD severity in gold stage. Thereafter, the goal is to prevent exacerbations, both through pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions listed here, and through the continued review of symptoms, evaluation of MDI technique and adherence to medications, an adjustment of therapy, including changing the inhaler devices or escalation of medicines as necessary. Goal guidelines also provide algorithms for escalation of therapy based on dyspnea and exacerbations and use information like blood acinophil counts, development of pneumonia, smoking history, and lung functions and symptoms to make clinical decisions about the next therapy to add. One important aspect of COPD management that needs to be considered includes potentially limiting inhaled corticosteroid use. This could be especially helpful in low and middle income countries as it is one fewer medicine to worry about. There is strong evidence for a link between inhaled corticosteroid use and pneumonia in COPD. So one should consider switching to effective lava lama combinations if there's no history or features of asthma, low blood eosinophils, or infrequent and non-hospitalized exacerbations to decrease complications without giving much up in terms of outcomes. Finally, what challenges exist in the implementation of gold guidelines in low and middle income countries? There are, several, there are several which will be explored in depth by our invited speakers. But briefly, these include a lack of availability of lung function testing, which can limit diagnosis and management. Low penetrance of gold guidelines outside specialist practices lack of implementation or dissemination of gold guidelines by governments and ministries of health and importantly lack of availability affordability and sustainability of medications in particular many of the current standard inhalers and finally limited avenues for patient education to overcome these limitations relevant organizations and low and middle income country governments need to implement and disseminate plans for COPD management to reduce the gaps in both the diagnosis and management of COPD. Using questionnaires to help identify people at risk of having COPD and identify initial pharmacotherapy are easy to implement and can be, and can be scaled up without significant added cost. Finally, there are several implementation practices recognized as best buys, including public health messaging and making medicines more accessible that will have an impact on COPD outcomes among those afflicted by this chronic respiratory condition.
Welcome, my name is Job van Boven. I'm in Principal Investigator at the Groningen Research Institute for Asthma and COPD, based in the Netherlands at the University Medical Center Groningen. And here we will discuss uh, the availability and access to COPD guidelines in low and middle income countries, LMICs. These are my disclosures, who grants and fees are paid to my institution. And so let's look into the uh, overall mortality due to COPD. And if we then look at the latest numbers that are also quoted in, in the gold document, is that around 90% of COPD deaths occur in uh, low and middle income countries. As such, optimizing COPD treatment in LMICs would have the greatest impact on mortality due to COPD. And guidelines are a great vehicle to achieve this, given these are evidence-based uh, interventions that are recommended. However, guidelines uh, to be implemented uh, should be affordable, uh, the interventions, they should be practical, they should be cost-effective, should be acceptable, they should be safe, and should be equitable. If these criteria are not met, these guidelines may not be as beneficial and cannot be properly implemented. Previous guidelines, uh, previous guideline reviews in the past have focused on assessing the quality mostly of the guidelines and they focused on the development, the content, the specific monitoring of recommendations. However, these previous reviews have not focused on LMIC guidelines uniquely. Last year, in 2021, we performed a scoping review to identify gaps and topics to be prioritized in future reviews, where we specifically focused on the, the national COPD guidelines in low and middle income countries. How were these guidelines identified? Because this can be pretty challenging as not all were published in, in, in English the language literature. However, we started with a search in PubMed and BASE, but we also looked in guideline repositories and reached out to a global network of the GACD, the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases, and the Authors Network. We aimed to identify national guidelines targeted towards COPD prevention, diagnosis, and management, so the broader uh, guidelines. For each of these guidelines, we summarized the content, the, the, the development using the Institute of Medicine quality criteria, and the applicability per country, also summarized by LMICs, low middle income countries versus high income countries. And these were our findings. In, in total, we could identify 61 guidelines around the world. And of those, around half 30 were from LMICs. However, when we look at this map here in red, the low and middle income countries, and in blue, the higher income countries, we can see that 30% of those living in LMICs, so is almost 2 billion people, versus only 2% of people living in high income countries, the so 0.02 billion people, were not covered by a nationally tailored COPD guideline. You can see the light red parts guide, uh, countries have not a national guideline that's tailored to their local situation. And this is primarily in Sub Saharan Africa where we don't see availability of national COPD guidelines. So what do these guidelines target? Who do they target actually? So first we look, most of them will clearly target um, specialists and GPs. However, especially in high income countries, we see a, a much more multidisciplinary approach. So nurses, pharmacists, physiotherapists, dietitians are also targeted as to take over certain care for COPD patients. In LMICs, nurses, physiotherapists, and dietitians were uh, less often uh, targeted with COPD guidelines. What type of content do they cover? Um, the one and only that's been covered in all guidelines, being it in low middle income countries or high income countries, are pharmacological treatments with 100% inclusion. Um, in low middle income countries, case finding and comorbidity management received less attention, and this was a significant difference. What's also of interest is the risk factors. Clearly, over 90% of the guidelines included smoking cessation advice. However, looking into other risk factors, and those are risk factors 
usually more relevant for low middle income countries, such as air pollution, being it indoor or outdoor, reduction strategies or preventive strategies were only mentioned in less than half of the LMIC guidelines. And it was even worse in high income country guidelines for COPD. Then have a look at the quality of the guidelines. Looking into the, the, the eight IOM, Institute of Medicine criteria, on average, LMIC guidelines fulfilled 3.37 or 42% of the standards compared to 66% in high income countries. Especially the low middle income country guidelines uh, scored lower with regards to conflict of interest management of the, the authors of their guideline, uh, the frequency of updating the guideline, the articulation of recommendations. So how well can these uh, recommendations actually be implemented, which is very important and uh, transparency on who funded the guideline. So in summary, when we look into the global coverage of, of national COPD guidelines, we see large differences. And these large differences result in health disparities between low middle income countries and high income countries. For some countries, we could argue that they still have the gold document that they could basically translate and use in their own country. However, um, whether these can be directly implemented remains questionable, and I'll get back to that in the next slide. And in general, we see that especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are no guidelines in place despite the existence of gold, and they really need their own guidelines. And I will illustrate this with this study from Nigeria, which was basically on a survey of 156 healthcare professionals, including GPs, internal medicine doctors, and, and pulmonologists, on the familiarity with the gold statement and their implementation of these guidelines. Uh, and shockingly, only 23%, uh, 22.7% reported adhering to these gold COPD guidelines. And in clinical practice, for example, only 32% had given smoking cessation advice, despite a large majority of their patients being smokers. Less than a quarter had performed spirometry and 18% had assessed severity. Here you can see on the left, you can see the actual implementation of recommendations that varies between zero or 2% to, to 72% uh, for some, uh, some other interventions. And their main barriers are here uh, presented in the, the, the figure on the right. You see reasons why they cannot implement the COPD, the international COPD guidelines are lack of familiarity, a lack of awareness of these guidelines, lack of time, they don't agree with the recommendations. And sometimes it's not even possible to to apply recommendations from international guidelines in local settings, given different regional risk factors, different staff resources, different financial situations or cultural beliefs. So um, in 2021, uh, a group of, of experts on, on COPD and low middle income countries came together at an ATS workshop and we discussed uh, specific recommendations on how to improve the implementation of COPD guidelines in low middle income countries. And uh, the authors led by uh, John Hurst came up with 10 key recommendations. I think four of the key ones are that LMICs need specific management guidance tailored to their local situation. Also, there needs to be more uh, emphasis on the early life origins of COPD, especially as we know in low middle income countries, under nutrition, even starting in utero, exposure to, uh, to, to smoke, uh, indoor air pollution, outdoor uh, in early childhood might result in, in, in COPD in, in later life. So they, they really need to uh, focus also on exposure reduction and prevention here. And in case that medicines and treatments are recommended, they should take into account the local availability and affordability of these treatments, which, which can be really challenging. So in conclusion, uh, we have uh, found that there are several gaps in the COPD guidelines for the LMICs, and many countries don't even have a locally tailored national COPD guideline. 
this discrepancy may hinder effective implementation of, of guidelines and, and, and recommendations. So um, we, we can recommend that CBD guidelines and LMICs should at first be more available and developed. They should be transparently developed and also frequently updated. And very important, they need to be tailored to the setting, the available financial and staff resources. And especially they need to include the local risk factors, uh, the resources and, and healthcare professionals that are locally active and available to treat patients with COPD and take into account the context. And this can be financial context, it can be cultural context. Also, we advocate for a multidisciplinary approach so that the burden of treatment can be shared among different healthcare professionals with each their own specialties. We might uh, want to focus on case finding because we can, if we can early identify these patients, uh, we may be able to slow down disease progression. Also, a lot of attention should be on, on uh, prevention, so it's not only smoking cessation, but specifically also air pollution and comorbidity management. As we know, COPD has uh, many comorbidities linked to COPD itself. I'd like to acknowledge all the uh, co-authors of this uh, systematic scoping review that was published in CHEST last year, led by uh, my PhD student Aisha Maltabishova from Kyrgyzstan. And also like to thank all the collaborators from the different countries that helped in translating and interpreting uh, different local uh, COPD guidelines. If you want to read more, here are the papers that I cited, including the implementation papers uh, mentioned in the, in the last slides. And here's my email address. Thank you in advance. I'm looking forward to... Uh, to for Hello, everyone. I'm Babatunde Okola, and I've been asked to speak on perspectives on COPD management and associated risk factors in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to be following this outline. Um, we start with the current state of COPD management and then move to suitability of um, COPD guidelines internationally, um, then talk on COPD risk factors in low and middle income countries, and then current interventions to change the paradigm. Um, throughout this 15-minute uh, talk, I'm going to be referencing studies done within Sub-Saharan Africa on all these um, issues that I've highlighted under the outline. As a way of starting, the knowledge um, of um, COPD diagnosis and management among general practitioners, family physicians, and pulmonologists in Sub-Saharan Africa is suboptimal. Um, this was by Ozo et al. Here in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, general practitioners are doctors that um, have have the MD or the MBBS degree and nothing else, while family physicians have our postgraduate training in primary care and pulmonologists been the chest uh, physicians. Um, West African Journal of Medicine 2014 um, was where Ozo et al. made um, this statement while uh, publishing the work, and we're going to quote from this quite extensively today. Um, the rate of diagnosis of COPD and appropriate management depends on the knowledge and the ability of doctors. And um, spe the specialty that doctors um, choose tends to affect their knowledge of COPD in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this, as shown in uh, Table 2 that I just uh, projected, um, showing the level of knowledge of doctors by specialty regarding COPD, uh, pulmonologists and the highest or the best level of knowledge, while the general practitioners are the poorest or the lowest level of knowledge of COPD. Um, this difference was subjected to a chi-square test and it was statistically significant. Aside from the specialty of the doctors, um, the location of the practice, urban better than rural, and um, access to spirometry, having better than not having, were other determinants of good knowledge of COPD. And um, Thankfully, virtually all the doctors studied recognized um, exposure to COPD risk factors with at least 92% in each category, recognizing these risk factors correctly. And um, the use of spirometry to confirm COPD diagnosis was selected by all pulmonologists at 5% of family physicians and 82% of um, 
general practitioners. Above half of the doctors studied by Ozo et al. had access to spirometry, but most of these people are based in apex institutions, that's the tertiary or the teaching hospitals, 14% in private hospitals, and very few of them are in primary care. And unfortunately in Africa, primary care is where most of the problem present most of the time with most of their complaints. And when the medications for COPD were listed as in the figure below, steroids, oral, inhaled, cough syrup, diuretics, inhaled brocodilators, oral, brocodilators, and antibiotics, um, doctors were asked to pick out the best two ideal treatment modalities for stable COPD. 12.5% um, of general practitioners picked inhaled brocodilators and steroids only, while it's 0.2% of family physicians did the same, and 40% of pulmonologists did the same. Um, Desalu et al. went further to study the barriers that exist in the use of inhaled medications among patients and among doctors, and uh, the cultural ones stand out for the patients. Uh, first, the patients believe that if they use um, their inhaled inhalers um, regularly, they will become dependent on it and will not be able to breathe normally without the use of the inhalers. And also the third stigmatization where the next person sees them as an invalid because they need the inhaler to survive. Affordability of medications and availability of the same were also other system factors that this alone at all pointed out. Um, availability of diagnostic tests is affected, uh, affects the management of COPD. And that's very true. And um, in talking about access to facilities, we need to know that spirometry-based diagnosis of COPD following globally accepted case definitions is a standard way of confirming COPD and not clinical um, grounds. You can suspect clinically, but you need spirometry to confirm the diagnosis of um, COPD. Um, possession of a spirometer um, and adequate training and retraining spirometry are equally important because if the spirometer is present and the people are not trained to use them or there's no capacity, is as good as useless. South Africa currently has the most robust training system for spirometry. In 2009, Merothra et al. reported lack of spirometers and quality spirometry services in um, the sub-Saharan Africa region. Um, when they contacted physicians in 39 countries, less than 20% of them said they had access to spirometers. In 2001, the study by Plum et al seem to show that some improvements in this, where some 3% of the doctors, of the 37 doctors uh, studied, reported ownership of the spirometer, 66% of them having uninterrupted spirometry services, and 77% some, some of them some, some of them having had um, training in how to use a spirometer, and 70% in how to interpret a spirogram. For unavailability, um, lack of capacity, costs, uh, spirometry seen as being unnecessary by hospital managers, and lack of training and lack of disposables were uh, some of the reasons given for the unavailability. And also they stated, and I quote, that where spirometry is available, the quality is variable and dependent on the skill of the operator. For access to facilities for treatment, um, local availability, cost, and affordability of medications um, impacts management uh, directly. And data on this availability and affordability is sparse, scarce in sub-Saharan Africa. In many of the studies that I saw, availability was defined as 80% of, of the pharmacy facilities having the medications, while affordability was defined in, in, in days of wages where medications that cost less than three less or equal to three days wages for the lowest paid government worker if for a month supply is seen as affordable. In a study by Sayang et al. in, in twenty twenty one in the Gambia, Sabjamol inhaler was seen as the most available um, inhaler, with the nebulizer formulation being the next most available. Prednisolone five milligram and ivory hydrocortisone were the most available um, steroids, with erythromycin being the most available uh, respiratory 
um, antibiotic. The non-available medicines were beclometasone and other preventer combinations, these ICS, LABAS, LAMAS, LAMA, LABA. And um, regarding affordability, it takes four days wages to get one month supply of inhaled salbutamol and uh, 15 days wages to get a, 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 a unit of um, ipratropium bromide, the 20 microgram um, dosage. Um, the nebles for salbutamol costs um, relatively affordable with three days wages, but the nebulizer needed to drive these nebles costs is 163 days wages. And please note that all these um, figures might be suboptimal because 70% of the people in the Gambia work in the informal sector and they earn much less than the government workers. Still about on access to uh, facilities for treatment, um, the greatest available medications by Plometor were prednisolone 5 mg followed by inhaled sabutamol, with hypertropium bromide and budesonide from heterol combinations being the least available. Um, major way that people pay for these medications is out of pocket. Others are government subsidies, health insurance, free offerings, and mixed payment methods. And when they probed on the reason for unavailability, costs come stops, and the medicines not being on the national essential drug list followed with supply chain problems, procurement challenges, limited prescription from doctors, and expiry on pharmacy shelves been the other reasons for unavailability. For national guideline coverage in um, sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world, 30.2% of um, LMICs um, are not covered by national COPD guidelines, and that translates to 1.93 billion people, while only 1.9% of people in high-income countries are not covered by national COPD guidelines, which is 0 0.02 billion people. This was by Tabishova et al. in 2021. Um, we need guidelines to facilitate cost-effective COPD care, but the development, effective dissemination and implementation of this is um, critical and challenging in Sub-Saharan Africa. To have a very good guideline, the eight clear criteria by, stated by the Institute of Medicine must be complied with. And on the average, most of the guidelines from low and middle income countries adds about 42% compliance, while that from high income countries was about 66% compliance. Um, it's worthy to note that um, low and middle income country guidelines caught poorly on conflict of interest management updates, articulation of recommendations, and transparency of funding for the guidelines. And this was not only in COPD guideline formulation, but that of hypertension and diabetes, as further explained and uh, reported by Ola Bey et al. in 2016 and 2018 in um, hypertension and uh, diabetes care, respectively. Local adaptations of international guidelines in um, Sub-Saharan Africa may not work well because of some reasons. Um, has context-specific inclusions been done, or are these guidelines just simple, mere translations? Local COPD prevalence, use factors and resources, are they available? And um, are, they, are the guidelines tailored towards all this? Epidemiological data locally, have these been incorporated into the guidelines? And then have we made sure that the understanding of physicians, nurses, and, and um, um, physiotherapists that use this is on point with the guidelines or are they, are they falling short? And as such, Tabishova et al. summed this up by saying that um, the feasibility of use of guidelines in various settings will depend on um, demographic, infrastructural, healthcare, budgetary, cultural, and environmental factors. Before we leave this issue of international guidelines, um, dissemination is another big challenge and um, a Achilles heel of um, effective guideline use. And fewer than 25% of LMIC guidelines had any dissemination plans in place. Therefore, they, it renders them ineffective. And um, lack of awareness of uh, COPD guidelines is definitely an hindrance to adherence of its recommendations. 
um, and international guideline updates unfortunately gets disseminated at uh, medical in true medical journals eminent rounds and academic meetings which sub saharan african doctors have a limited access to um the doctor studied by Zoe Tom unfortunately had low familiarity to gold guidelines, especially the non pulmonologists even though the attitude to the guidelines was good because they believed that improves diagnosis and clinical outcome. However, they're not familiar with them, so even though the attitude is um, encouraging, they will not be able to adhere to its recommendations. Talking about risk factors for LM um, COPD and LMICs, um, the pulmonologists tended to have uh, better knowledge and um, their knowledge was way higher, was higher than that of um, family physicians and general practitioners. And um, this difference in knowledge had um, significant uh, statistical um, evidence. The risk factors highlighted in the study by Ozo et al. for COPD in Sub-Saharan Africa are age, gender, cigarette smoking, indoor biomass exposure, childhood lower respiratory tract infection, and past history of tuberculosis. Uh, in our study of um, systematic review and meta-analysis of COPD in Africa, um, the pools odds ratio for the effect of current smoking versus never smoking on COPD was 2.20, with a narrow confidence interval of between 1.62 and 2.99. Gamat et al. in 2010, um, highlighted in their systematic review that current or ever smoking, prior tuberculosis, occupational exposures, air pollution in and out, and biomass fuel use were risk factors for COPD in low and middle income countries. So tying all this up, what interventions can change the story of COPD in Sub-Saharan Africa? One is education, systematic COPD education, training more long health specialists, doctors, nurses, therapists, and other allied health workers, and giving access to cutting edge literature that shows the updates in international guidelines and what is going on all around um, COPD wise. Next is spirometry, investing in high quality spirometers and spirometry and using the existing public health delivery channels to ensure that people have um, access to it. Followed by uh, manufacture of reusable mouthpieces. Um, I, I find this a bit interesting but this was is said to um, uh, have the potential of cutting costs to the patient for spirometry services. Uh, I need to mention that the Pan-African Thoracic Society and the American Thoracic Society usually organize um, an annual spirometry training and retraining course in Africa as part of the MECO program um, so that people that train go back to offer good services. The third is guidelines, locally developed and adapted national guidelines in strict observance of the Institute of Medicine criteria that are uh, well implemented and updated. Tobacco control comes next. Um, the legislation against, against tobacco, campaign against tobacco, and clinical tobacco suggestion services in uh, facilities all through Sub-Saharan Africa. Research into COPD, a COPD medicine trials involving African populations, and also research into the barriers and facilitators of effective guideline implementation are um, important. This is also another um, um, mandate of the Pan-African Thoracic Society ATS MICO program. Health systems prioritization where chronic respiratory diseases are given the attention they deserve is another important intervention by all stakeholders. Medication procurement where affordable and quality uh, mass mass COPD medicines are made available for countries should be done. And there's an asthma drug facility in um, in the union when countries can tap into to get these quality medications at a real, at a good price. Last but definitely not the least is universal health coverage that includes chronic respiratory diseases for all stakeholders globally. The Gambia just um, went this way. Ghana um, recently uh, consolidated on theirs. And every country, both high income and low income, 
should consider having universal health coverage in order for people to have good care for chronic respiratory diseases and other ailments. These are the references I used. And thank you very much for listening. Many thanks to ATS for this invitation to share this webinar and with the topic perspectives on COPD management and associated factors in Latin America. I'm Alejandro Casas from Bogota, Colombia. I have no conflict with this presentation and I decide to divide the conference in two topics. First, prevalence and risk factors of COPD in Latin America. And second, treatment of COPD in real life and the availability of inhaled therapy in our countries. First, how is Latin America today? Latin America covers a vast geographic area, larger than, than US, Canada, or Western Europe, and distributed in at least 19 countries. The population has tripled since 1950, 600 million with massive migration from rural areas to cities in the last decades. There are a mix of ethnicities, including European, African, mulatto, mestizo, and Amerindians, on many different proportions. And we have one of the widest disparity in income within and between countries. Our chronic diseases are typical of our countries, and violence-related problems often overlap in some countries. And finally, the poor access to healthcare systems and poor quality of the service are key constraints. The first and fundamental aspect is the demographic transition in Latin America, which compared with developed countries has been a little slower, but with similar results. When analyzing the population pyramids between 1965 and the perspective on 2052, we observe how the classic population here with a broad base of young people is transforming into a population barrel today. And we expect at least 25% of the population will be over 60 years at age in 30 years. Life expectancy has increased 27 years in the last 30 years. However, these changes, of course, also condition an increase in the incidence and prevalence of COPD in the last 30 years. Added to these demographic and epidemiological changes in the inefficient and inefficient and ineffective management of the healthcare systems in Latin America regarding of COPD in terms of the morbidity and mortality. In the last 30 years, the number of disability adjust life years in COPD patients has increased considerably. The mortality rate increased from 17 to 25 deaths for uh, 100 southern, becoming the fourth cause of general death below cardiovascular, diabetes, and respiratory infections. Today show a prevalence of COPD in people over 40 years of age, of age in Latin America using the fixed ratio in 12.7%, with some difference in our four large epidemiological population studies. Latino from all Latin America, Prepocol in Colombia, Crónicas in Peru, and Epocar in Argentina. Added in our active case finding primary care study, the Puma study in four countries, we observe a prevalence of 21% with some difference between countries, Argentina 30.9%, and Venezuela, 11%. Understanding the prevalence of diagnosis and underdiagnosis of COPD using the data from both 
Latino Prepocol and EpiScan in around 31,000 subjects and using the lower limit of, of normal to define COPD, we can see the significant differences in prevalence in our countries in Latin America compared with the world. For example, Barranquilla was 3.6% and Montevideo 90% compared with Cape Town 11, 19%. Overall, the percent of underdiagnosis of COPD was 81.4%. In Latin America, was higher, 85.6%, and the prevalence of underdiagnosis of COPD was 12.7%. In Latin America, the odds of underdiagnosis were, were significantly higher among persons with lower age, lower obstruction lower respiratory symptoms and no prior diagnosis of asthma. Only 1 to 3 or 34 percent reported ever undergoing spirometry prior to a study in Latin America. Showing the inaccurate diagnostic level, leveling in COPD in Latin America, in the Puma study, only 6 percent of the participants had a previous diagnosis of COPD. The underdiagnosis of patients with confirms of COPD was 77%, and those who had a previous diagnosis of COPD was 69%, if had a correct prior diagnosis. The misdiagnosis, overdiagnosis, or wrong diagnosis was near to 30%. The difference in percent of underdiagnosis in the countries was lowest in Colombia and highest in Venezuela, with a middle of 75%. And COPD underdiagnosis was associated with obese patients, mild to moderate obstruction, black race subjects, absence of symptoms, and no history of exacerbations. The risk factors in non-smokers in the Platino study show that the prevalence of COPD varied among the five cities studied, but variability was slightly lowered for COPD in never smokers from two to Mexico to 5.4 in Santiago, than ever smokers from 3.5 in Mexico to 10 in Montevideo. In Prepocol study, the risk factors in the logistic regression model were older history of TB, ever smoking, lower level of education, passive smoking, male gender, and would smoke exposure more than 10 years with, and in the last item, an OR of 1.5 with significance as risk factor or COPD. Biomass fuels are used for cooking and heating by nearly 40% in world's population, mainly in unserved rural areas of developing countries. In our studies, the estimate risk for COPD is three times higher in women and two times higher in men exposed, exposed to biomass smoke. Dependence of biomass fuel use in this axis and socioeconomic status measured by GNP per capita in this axis shows a higher use in rural areas than in urban areas and compared in the different countries in Latin America. In the Prepocol study of never smokers, COPD prevalence was 6.7% in exposed and if the subject was exposed to wood smoke and tobacco, the risk was higher 
16% and the prevalence was higher when the years of exposition to biomass exposure increase. The second topic is the treatment of COPD in real life and the availability of therapy in our countries. In the Platinum study, half of COPD patients had ever been advised by a physician to quit smoking, while near to 70% of them with a prior medical diagnosis had received such advice. Only one of four patients, 24.7%, had received some type of respiratory medication, and in the group of patients with a prior medical diagnosis of COPD, only 11% received some bronchodilator inhaled medication in the life. The spirometry was the main factor associated with the prescription of therapeutic measures. The use of respiratory medication during the preceding year in COPD patients classified according to gold stage of severity indicate an increase in the use of medication as disease severity progress and near to 65% in stage 3 or 4. The factors associated with COPD treatment in Platino were a physician advised to quit smoking was associated with the presence of symptoms and regardless of the degree of bronchial obstruction. Vaccination against influenza with older age and symptoms. The use of bronchodilators was, was associated with symptoms and prior medical diagnosis. The probability of being prescribed corticosteroids was greater in women and those with a prior medical diagnosis and a history of a smoking was associated with a greater use of preventive treatment and a higher rate of prescription of bronchodilators. In the full study, the pharmacologic treatment in COPD in primary care patients shows that SAVA monotherapy or SAVA ICS were the most commonly used medication both as needed or regular basis. In those with a prior medical diagnosis, the percent of use of LAMA or LAVA was low and LAVA CIS was 13%. Other study, the LASIC study, the Latin American non-interventional study of symptoms in COPD with specialists, the respiratory medication use in COPD patients were mainly ICS lava or triple open therapy ICS lava lama, and also in each of the gold 2013 categories. More than 90% of the patients were using ICS combination without a prior medical diagnosis of asthma and mainly without exacerbation history. A small proportion use only lava, 6% or lava, 6% to monotherapy or dual bronchodilation, only 11%. Of the patients using lava or SAMA monotherapy, more than 50% use this as a regular maintenance therapy. And last, the adherence to treatment using the text to measure to adherence to another therapy, the TAI questionnaire, showed that the use of SAMA or SAVA monotherapy showed the lowest adherence, poor adherence in uh, a half on 44% of patients respectively, and the treatment with LAVA or LAMA had a better, better adherence and good adherence in more than 50% of the patients. In conclusion, the opportunities to some challenge in COPD in Latin America 
in terms of the underdiagnosis is to improve access to diagnostic services in primary care, to advance in development, developing reliable and portable spirometry, including training personnel, maintenance, and quality control and interpreting results, and promote and implement the use of simple and accurate tools for COPD screening in the population risk. And in the gap between the recommendation for COPD guidelines and the pattern of medication pres prescription in primary care and specialists in Latin America, uh, where opportunities are that the drugs used more frequently in all groups are ICS lava combination and triple therapy, open. And the real problem is the lava or lama or lava lama are rarely used in the real life. The other point is to improve the availability and access to treatment in patients with COPD, prioritize broader access to effective and cost-effective pharmacologic intervention, and finally, to promote the use of standardized guidelines, diagnosis and treating COPD, education of patients and healthcare providers, considering the heterogeneity with as well as between countries. Thank you very much for the invitation and it's open to questions. For those excellent talks. Um, remember to type in your question in the QA chat box. Um, and I'll be discussing this with the panelists. So we have um, Will, is my co chair on this webinar, Job and Tunde. Uh, around. Please, could you um, put your questions in the chat box? Great. Thanks. Um, there's a question here um, already, and um, it's for Baba Tunde. He's already responded, but I'll read it just for the sake of people who have not had the opportunity to look into the chat box. Um, and he reads, um, you mentioned that there is an asthma medication facility within the union which can provide medications for low and middle income countries. And he wants to know where this asthma medication facility is located. Tunde, if you could unmute. Okay, I will also read Tunde's response because he already typed in a response and he says that the asthma drug facility was a Union and World Bank project initiative that provided medications for LMICs. However, he, he realized that the, this has been closed and that is no longer um, available. And my question would have been to, for, for Tunde would have been to, what does he propose? Um, how can um, we improve access to COPD medicines in Sub-Saharan Africa. This um, union um, opportunity is closed, like you said. Do you have any thoughts on how to improve access to medicine for COPD in Sub-Saharan Africa? You know? um, yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you everyone for this opportunity. Um, I, th I think countries in low and middle income countries cannot continue shying away from the fact that there is need to give um, chronic respiratory diseases the place they deserve. Um, one, the paper that um, I said I saw after submitting my slides spoke about the fact that many countries don't even have a budget for COPD asthma medications. So that's actually ampered the um, success of the asthma drug facility of the union because um, the stakeholders they were working with were not forthcoming. So that discouraged the um, donors, the pharmaceutical companies and other donors, they got donor fatigued and the initiative died a natural death. So I feel that uh, there's need for advocacy 
at all levels um, in the health systems in low and middle income countries that we are in a double double jeopardy. The infectious diseases are doing their thing. The non-infectious or the non-communicable diseases, especially chronic respiratory diseases, are also catching up. So there is need to for everyone to sit up and commit uh, more funds to the procurement of um, quality drugs that patients need in um, taking care of these diseases. Um, that's my um, response. I mean, people can contribute, others with uh, maybe more experience in this field of research can also um, tell us what they think. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tunde. Um, Job or Will, do you have any um, thoughts on how we can improve access to medicines for low and middle income countries for COPD? Because we're talking about procurement um, is one way, any way that we can reduce cost, for example, by having a procurement method that um, could reduce cost. Well, that requires uh, involvement from multilateral organizations. And we've seen this already uh, at play with uh, WHO and PAHO, for example, with the implementation of the, uh, of the HEARTS program in hypertension. Um, we know that PAHO is providing uh, also uh, facilitation uh, for purchasing of medicines uh, for many low and middle income countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I think something similar should be thought of uh, for, uh, for chronic respir respiratory disease treatment as well. You know, being able to involve multilateral organizations to be able to work with governments uh, to figure out what's, what's most cost effective and what's the best way to, to provide uh, uh, medicines with, uh, you know, just in, especially in those uh, resource limited settings of uh, low and middle income countries. So there's a the big breach. You know, one thing is having it available in capital cities and like, for example, Peru, having it in Lima where most things are available, but once you leave Lima, it just gets that much more difficult to get access to medicines. Yeah, and if I might add to this, um, it could start at least to, to get the attention for the, the non-availability is to get the essential COPD medications or on the essential medicines list of the WHO. I, I noticed a specific comment on, on theotropium and on rovlumilas, for example, in the in the other in one of the other questions. Uh, actually, theotropium has just become part of the essential medicine list a, a couple of years ago, I believe. So this is the starting point. What would also will really help affordability will be the availability of generic versions now of, of theotropium, for example, being available increasingly. And the more competitors, uh, the more generic companies, of course, um, that, that will have a, a generic version available would help also lowering the price because that's essential. For Ruf Lumilast, I believe it's not on the essential medicines list yet. Uh, and I wonder also about its role. It, it has a small role, in, in my opinion, in COPD treatment. So I, it, it, uh, it has, a, especially with patients with chronic bronchitis, it might be needed. Uh, it could be of help, but it's not first line treatment uh, in, in many of the guidelines. Um, and also, I think there's, yeah, it, it's a multi stakeholder role, but definitely also uh, the industry could, could play a role here in, in having. Uh, cheap generics, uh, at least available uh, across the world. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I also believe that um, for when we have made these guidelines, we should really streamline the guidelines for low and middle income countries, perhaps have one or two medications. Like you said, Ruflimilas barely has a role. And I don't think, I wouldn't support that on an essential medicine list for a low and middle income country. Yeah. No, I want to keep focus on the, the cornerstone treatments, like, like having good bronchodilators available, for example, also the long acting ones, but could help in adherence, as we noticed, which is an issue as well, with, uh, and that it was clearly laid out. Yeah, thanks. And that leads me to, um, Will, a question I have. You know, one of the, when you were talking about the high value buys, you said perhaps inhaled corticosteroids may not be a high value buy for COPD in low and middle income countries. However, there was a slide that also showed that 
uncontrolled asthma is one of the highest risk factors for COPD in lower middle income countries. And that's so true. We actually see that in our clinical practice that uncontrolled asthma is the highest one of, is the, in fact, the most um, prevalent risk factor for COPD in our setting. So inhaled corticosteroids may be able, well, the combination therapy specifically will be serving both purposes. So what do you say to that recommendation? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, I think uh, we have to consider tailoring use of inhaled corticosteroids uh, and, and use them also with, uh, um, you know, just with care when you're thinking about your patient. So think about your the context uh, of your patient. And as I said, I think uh, and we know that inhaled corticosteroids work really well uh, in asthma. Um, they have some role also in COPD, but there are groups of people who don't necessarily need to be on, on inhaled corticosteroids, uh, especially if they have uh, low eosinophils, if they're not having a lot of exacerbations, not being hospitalized, uh, you know, just uh, because there are also uh, risk factors. Uh, there's the risk associated with the use of inhaled corticosteroids. So more than not it being a, a high value therapy, it's just that we have to be judicious about how we use inhaled corticosteroids and, uh, and uh, use all our other uh, tools that we have in our, uh, in our respiratory toolbox. You know, we really wanna make sure that we're maximizing the use of short and long acting bronchodilators uh, to be able to help with, uh, with reducing symptoms and preserving lung function uh, uh, and, and uh, and in kind of improving overall quality of life. Uh, I think in health corticosteroids does have a role, but I think we should we should just be more judicious in the setting of uh, of COPD. Thanks. Um, we have another question, and um, is asking for how suggest ways to increase access to spirometry across countries within sub-Saharan Africa. Tunde, that I think that question is for you. Tunde, did you hear the question? Um, yes, I did. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to answer another one. So um, I one way to um, increase access to spirometry is to first of all train um, health workers, long health workers in uh, Africa, Pan-Africa, um, to be very specific on the importance of uh, spirometry. Uh, for too long, a lot of doctors are used to working and managing in court without spirometry. The first thing is to get people used to what is right and what is a good clinical practice regarding spirometry. Now, once this is done, um, health systems prioritization of uh, quality spirometers and um, spirometry training would follow that. Um, because we, we don't want a situation where um, spirometers are produced, are provided, spirometry training is provided, and people don't utilize them because they actually are not convinced that they need to do that to give people good care. So education on good clinical practice regarding asthma, COPD, diagnosis and treatment, and monitoring of um, treatment outcomes, followed by um, provision of spirometers and spirometry training. Um, the MICO program has um, embedded in it a really nice um, spirometry training and retraining, which um, young enthusiastic physicians all over Africa can latch on and um, have uh, their training done. And uh, the lead trainer, Lindsay Zuba, can also do retraining um, on, um, online and actually can also come locally where people can gather and then have their, their uh, people retrain. So it's a very nice um, template that has worked. It worked in the Gambia, for example, where I live and work. Um, we brought her down, gathered people, did the training and retraining, and she's come back a second time. And everybody's enthusiastic about the introduction of spirometry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tunde. By the way, the MECO program is an um, ATS capacity building program for research in lower middle income countries. Um, 
Yeah, there's another comment in the chat chat box, and um, someone is um, is just a comment. He's saying that inhaler thiotropium and reflumulus are expensive, and that they are not available in most parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's another question. This says thanks for an excellent presentation on an important topic, and this question is um, asking about the role of postgraduate medical education training colleges such as the West African College of Physicians, what is their role in training and retraining physicians in writing or developing local guidelines? So really, do you think there's a role for local or national thoracic societies or postgraduate colleges in low and middle income countries to develop um, guidelines, not just COPD guidelines, perhaps other guidelines? Joe? Um, yes, definitely yes. Uh, if I look, yeah, if we look at the 60 guidelines that we identified in the, 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 the scoping review, the majority of them was uh, drafted or coordinated by uh, a national pulmonary society uh, or sometimes even uh, a, a general practitioner society, primary care involvement. So I think they should be the people with the expertise, as, as we also so, so noticed in the, in the other presentations, that pulmonologists are the ones most aware of also international developments in the uh, in the field of, of COPD. And being working locally, they are also able to translate this into what's locally available and, and affordable. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the only thing is, of course, the burden on these uh, societies that, that you need time and, and money to, to work on these guidelines. Creating a guideline is, is time. It, it costs a lot of time. But I think the starting point with the gold document and trying to create an adapted version, not, not translated version, because then you will run into all those problems of recommendations that are not uh, possible to implement, but trying to to adapt it and then tailor it to the local situation, looking into uh, local regional prevalence of COPD, risk factors of COPD, and, and all the treatments available. And we talked a lot actually about pharmacological treatment, but we should not forgo, forget about the non-pharmacological options we have that are mostly low cost, thinking about a low cost pulmonary rehabilitation, for example. We, we have worked very closely together with the, the Makarara Lung Institute in Uganda. And we have set up uh, together uh, with, with, with also uh, European uh, pulmonary rehab specialists, uh, a, a lot of rehab clinics uh, for, for, and with, with simple tools, but people really felt more energetic and, and having more capacity. So um, we should think about these options as well, I believe. Yeah, that's true. I was, I had um, my, I wanted to just follow up um, on the development of the guidelines. I recently um, had some interaction in a qualitative study with um, general practice clinicians, and they all felt they were not included in guideline development. Mean, meanwhile, most COPD patients are seen by general practice physicians. Because again, you described specialists, pulmonologists. What's the role of these general practice practitioners in the development of guidelines? I think you're you're fully correct that uh, it de might depend on the country, but in most countries, and I think especially in low income countries where there's a shortage of pulmonologists. I remember being in Uganda, there were I think five or six pulmonologists in the whole country that, that are formally trained as pulmonologists, and the vast majority are general practitioners or primary care physicians that are taking care of the, the COPD patients. So uh, yes, I, I strongly believe they should be involved. And we could, and, and also could even look beyond uh, looking into uh, allied health professionals, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, dietitians that could all play a part in the role of the treatment options we have available. So Especially, I think this, 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 we noticed this in our review as well, that they could be more involved, I believe. They are close to the community, to the people, and they are spread out all over the country instead of a few specialists in the referral hospitals, usually. 
Yeah, I think we should always bear that in mind, you know, the, include the users of the guideline in guideline development. Um, another question here says, one of the most important measures is the control of risk factors. And this person is asking about, are there new medications to smoking cessation? Will? Well, I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. I think uh, control risk factors is key. As, as uh, I said earlier on, COPD is both uh, preventable and treatable. So uh, controlling exposures, reducing exposures you know, uh, throughout the life course is likely to have a huge impact. We know that tobacco smoking has an impact at all levels, you know, just all the way from uh, affecting, uh, you know, just uh, affecting individuals when they're in utero, they're exposed to, uh, to parental smoking or secondhand smoke. Uh, same thing with household air pollution exposures uh, and all the way, you know, all the way to, to adulthood, like any, any type of environmental exposure that can have an effect on, uh, on, on lung function and development. Uh, the same goes with uh, thinking about uh, other uh, preventable forms, thinking about micronutrient deficiencies early in life, uh, in particular in the utero that can play a role in, 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 lung, in lung development uh, and alveolarization early on. Uh, I think we can do a better job with, uh, with uh, air pollution control, uh, at least uh, you know how it affects uh, how it affects lung function, how it affects development. And we know that uh, air pollution plays a, plays a big role in exacerbations, uh, you know, once you have the disease. Uh, but yes, so there are a good amount of uh, risk factors that we can do a better job at preventing. Um, respiratory infections early in life are known to also uh, affect uh, your trajectory of lung function uh, and uh, increase your risk of COPD in adulthood. So having, you know, just uh, vaccinations early on can play a big role uh, in, in, the, in that. And then of course, uh, uh, control of diseases like tuberculosis, uh, which, we are, which are also being shown to an important role in, in, affecting, in affecting your lung function and kind of uh, changing your trajectory towards COPD can play a big role. So there's risk factor control is incredibly important. Yeah, that's true. Um, the other questions I think have been addressed in the chat box. Um, so I just want to thank There's really one about vaccinations. I think I, I saw one around vaccinations that I think no. is important. I think uh, we, we've, we all know kind of the, the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, by, you know, just uh, vaccinations uh, and the role that influenza plays uh, in not only in exacerbations, but also in, a, in lung function. And the same with COVID, you know, we have to make sure. And, and uh, the same with uh, making sure that, that we're not only getting, uh, getting our, 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 you know, just the populations to be vaccinated uh, for, uh, you know, for, for common viruses, but also making sure that there are appropriate guidelines to make sure that adults are being covered for streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, and making sure that, that the EPI programs that occur early on, so API programs for you know hip vaccination and uh, uh, and, and others are, are are being followed carefully. Yeah, I think that's very important. Really, I don't. I'm not aware of um, adult vaccination guidelines in many parts in many low and middle income countries, at least in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so thank you everyone for an excellent session and um, discussion. It's been very engaging. I would just like to remind us again that this session is being recorded and it will be sent to all those who have registered and it will also be posted on the ATS um, YouTube channel. So please feel free to go back to it, send the link to your friends, your family, <laughs> yeah, and to everyone you know. Um, so thank you so much for attending attending and we wish you well and we wish you good health. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Mike. Thank Bye. you, Joe. Thank you, Will.